I'm going to give a background on the science of superblooms. This year, as we know, was an extraordinary, has it continues to be an extraordinary year for wildflowers. It's not over yet. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what creates uh, quote unquote superblooms. Um, we'll talk a little bit about their ecology and their conservation and, and why they are fragile habitats that are important to protect. And then we'll look at um, wildflower tourism and culture and how people um, over time have interacted with these botanical displays. Um, offer, offer some opportunities for discussion there. And, and then we'll look at um, past threats and emerging threats to these very fragile ecosystems and what we can do to conserve them and then kind of take a look to the future and the future of um, these wildflower ecosystems. So let's just first define wildflower. <laughs> so when we talk about wildflowers, generally we're thinking about herbaceous plants that are non-woody, so we're not thinking about trees. Um, and oftentimes they're annual or they can even be perennial plants. So off over here we have some penstemons in blue, the purple, and we also have um, the columbine, Aquilegia formosa. So I would definitely put those in the category of wildflower. Um, in addition, we have California poppies um, in the bright orange, and those are uh, that the, this California poppy is an annual, and um, so it completes its life cycle in one year, um, even less than a year. They usually these winter annuals they germinate in the winter time, usually around December, January, or February. Um, they start to grow as it gets a little warmer in March, um, and then they're really usually blooming pretty pretty good in April, and this is around the time as it starts to get warmer, they're starting to um, dry up a little bit, and then they're, they're putting their energy towards making seed, and then once they've completed making seed and dispersed that seed, they've completed their life cycle, and then they're, they're done, they've completed their whole life. Um, so, so that's when we think about wildflowers. In terms of the term super bloom, that's really more, I think, of a cultural term. It's not really a scientific term in terms of like when have we reached super bloom status. Um, I recently spoke to uh, the San Francisco Chronicle and they asked me what defines a super bloom. And I said, well, if you can see the flowers from space, I think that might be the qualification <laughs> for a super bloom. Uh, so that's my current working definition the years in which we can see flowers from space. <laughs> Uh, California has more kinds of plants than any other state in the United States. So being residents of California, we have access to just really extraordinary plant diversity. Um, so I feel very fortunate to have been born here, grew up in Los Angeles County, and then became a botanist where I get to study, you know, a place that's incredibly rich for plants. Um, so we have over 6,600 kinds of plants native to um, California, when we consider the non-natives, we're talking more like reaching 8,000 plants. So it's a lot of plant diversity here. Um, about a third of them only occur in California and nowhere else in the world. So we have, that's called endemism, when you're restricted to a particular geographic location. So we have a high degree of endemism in the state of California with having over a third. Um, and about 2,400 of our native plants are considered rare. So they've been evaluated by botanists and primarily based on their distribution, they are um, given some sort of category of rarity and they may have a conservation status. That means land managers may pay extra attention to them to promote their conservation so we don't cause extinction. Uh, so that makes wildflowers in California really extraordinary because we have so many kinds of plants. And a high proportion of those plants are these herbaceous wildflower kinds of plants. So this is based off of data in the database CalFlora. Um, and what it finds is that, so the annuals are that blue piece of the square and the herbaceous plants, the perennials, are this purple piece of the square, of the, the pie. And so we have about 80% of the diversity are these you know, herbaceous type plants. That doesn't mean necessarily that they're all wildflowers because we actually have a lot of herbaceous plants that aren't very showy and generally aren't considered wildflowers. So for instance, grasses and other 
grass-like plants generally aren't considered wildflowers because they don't have those showy flowers and they're wind pollinated. So we have a lot of wind pollinated plants. Um, but you can see that that general life form of that kind of uh, not woody herbaceous habit is the predominating life form in terms of overall plant diversity in California. So I think that is pretty interesting. Um, I have lots of pictures of wildflowers throughout this. I just wanted to call attention to the very amazing micro bloom of the pygmy poppy uh, because this is a dime for scale wow. up there. So some of our blooms are, we call them micro blooms <laughs> or uh, belly plants uh, where you have to like lay down on your belly to actually like, see them up close. And so it turns out that our climate plays a very big role in um, creating this phenomenon of the super bloom or having extraordinary wildflower displays. So in California, we experience a Mediterranean climate. So that means the, wind, the rain comes in the cold winter months. And right now we're heading into the drought season, right? We're unlikely to get any uh, rainstorms of any significance for the remainder uh, you know, until like fall or winter comes again. So we have this prolonged drought summer season. And so a lot of plants have adaptations to deal with that prolonged drought. And one adaptation is to be an annual plant. It's to ride out the long dry summer months as a seed in the soil and be dormant. And that means you don't have to deal with the heat, you don't have to deal with the dryness, because you lived your whole life in that cool, wet season. And uh, because we have that Mediterranean climate, that means we have this high proportion of annuals. And a lot of the perennials um, that form wildflowers are what we call geophytes. Geo meaning earth or ground, and phyte meaning plant. So these are plants that um, they um, live a portion of their life underground as a bulb, or a form or some underground storage structure, and they only have their um, sort of vegetative material come up when it's sort of cooler and wet. And so the genus Calipurtis, which is called the Mariposa lily, is a good example of a geophyte, um, as well as lilies themselves. We have a lot of lilies here in California as well, and those are definitely wildflowers. Um, so um, having a herbaceous habitat in, in California, being an annual or a geophyte, is really a, a drought evasion strategy to deal with that long-term summer drought. Um, and um, yeah, so we are one of five Mediterranean climate regions in the world. And it turns out when you go to these other Mediterranean climate regions, so that would be the Mediterranean Basin, South Africa, Western Australia, and Chile, um, those areas also experience the phenomenon of the super bloom. So I don't know if you've all ever seen pictures of the Atacama Desert when they get rain, but it's just covered in blankets of flowers and they also have super blooms. Uh, South Africa and Western Australia have a lively super bloom tourism sort of phenomenon just like we do here in California. In fact, in doing research for this talk, I just Googled uh, wildflower tourism because I was curious. And it was a bunch of pictures from Western Australia came up because uh, they have magnificent wildflower displays as well. So this isn't something specifically unique to California. Um, it is a phenomenon of the Mediterranean climate regions, um, but in the United States, it's certainly a unique phenomenon that California has these magnificent blooms. So um, what exactly is a super bloom? I said if you can see it from space, right? but it is uh, basically abundant and diverse displays of wildflowers. Um, so you oftentimes have many different species co-flowering, and then you know you get those pictures where it looks like the hillside has been splattered with pink colors. You have purple here, orange there, a patch of yellow, um, and that's because many different species have responded to the rain. And this occurs because usually um, we have above annual, um, well above the long-term average uh, rainfall occurring in that winter, those winter months when the super bloom, you know, is getting started. Um, and a study was done and found that in the Mojave Desert, it usually takes about 30 to 40 percent the long-term average of rain for a super bloom to really get started. So you have to have really significant winter precipitation 
Um, and then usually that precipitation is falling um, from uh, across many months. It's not just coming in February or just in March. You know, you would have gotten some rain in December, January, February, and March. And that's one of the things that happened this year in 2023. We had a dry December, but we got we had our first set of atmospheric rivers in early January. And from then on, it was like, right, every week or two weeks, it just kept raining and raining and raining. And we had storms up until March. Um, so it was really a prolonged rainy season. And um, the, although the first atmospheric river was actually quite warm, it wasn't very cold storm, subsequent storms were cold. You know, we had a lot of snowpack, we had a lot of snowfall. And so it's that range of temperatures, experiencing rain across a gradient of temperatures, across uh, a, a time span that would assist the plants in not only germination, but growth and then, you know, carry them out until they're flowering. That's what created the, the magnificent bloom we have experienced this year, especially in the Carrizo Plain and out in Lancaster where all the poppies were blooming. And we also had a lot in Riverside County as well. Um, and um, another thing I wanted to say about that is, there was something else I wanted to say, I kind of lost my train of thought. But, um, oh, so it's really important to have the rain um, kind of carry through into March because, you know, the whole goal of the super bloom is for plants to reproduce and to produce seed. And so if we were to have conditions where we had an extraordinary amount of rain in December and January, but then nothing in um, February, March, or April, um, and in fact, it started to get really hot in February and March, we might not have those magnificent displays because all that water could be evaporated, the plants could get desiccated. So it really requires having also cool temperatures and you know that prolonged season. So that's a very important aspect of it. Um, so I talked a little bit about these required conditions, 30 to 40% above the long-term average and that the span is across a broad season. Uh, this is one of those Mariposa lilies I was talking about. These are some of my favorite wildflower plants in California. Uh, so here's a graph that shows, um, this is uh, just one location of a place where I study plants just east of Death Valley. It's a village called Shoshone. Um, it's right at the border of California and Nevada. And it's known for having magnificent wildflower displays just like Death Valley. And so I looked at um, historical climate data using a database called PRISM, which is a publicly available climate data. Um, and um, I, this, is, this dashed line here is the long-term average. And then the orange dash up here is um, the 30 to 40% threshold. So we need to get this much rain for a super bloom to happen. Mm -hmm. So you see those peaks with the stars those are years of super bloom events that are known to have happened in this region. So, um, um, so I had to ask, you know, people who have lived there a while, because some of this goes beyond my time as botanist. Um, but um, I heard of these, um, you know, some of this is associated with El Nino events, um, but El Nino events do not always yield this increased precipitation. So it's not like we have El Nino conditions and we're gonna have a lot of rain and we're gonna have a super bloom. It's not automatic, but um, they, uh, they do frequently occur together. Um, so the first super bloom I ever experienced was in 2005, which is on the map, that would be this star here. Um, and then another super bloom I experienced was in 2016, which interestingly is here and below the threshold. Um, that was like, it was only like one storm that came in October that just like, and then the bloom was really early. The bloom happened like in February and then it was done by March. So that was a very unusual year. But it was, and it was very specific to Death Valley region. And then we had a pretty good year in 2019 as well, as you can remember. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about 2019, what happened there with some wildfire tourism. Um, so this is this year. And this is a, 
uh, Matt made by a, a climatologist I follow on Twitter. He makes really excellent maps. His name is Brian uh, Brettschneider, and he lives in Alaska, but he, he does all these cool visuals and you know, weather visuals and maps. This was a, a, a map based on um, precipitation that had occurred this year up until February, um, and ranking it against the wettest years. And so green is like, means that that area experienced its wettest year on record. And blue means it's within the top five wettest years. And so we can see by February, certain parts of California had already experienced its wettest year and other um, parts of California were in its top five wettest year. So we just had really extraordinary conditions this year that made for um, that is making for great wildflower viewing opportunities that's going to continue through the season because we're not done yet. Like I said, you know, the lower elevations maybe are drying up, but you can always go higher elevation, you know, go up to higher elevations in the mountains. I'll maybe mention some places you can think about going this year to catch, continue to catch the bloom. So it really creates this magnificent parade of color. Um, we get all the different colors in the color wheel. So we're gonna like explore some blooms and we're gonna look at uh, all the color wheel that um, California wildflowers provide. Um, and, and even individual flowers can have multiple colors. I love this flower is Lupinus albifrons variety Johnstonii. This is actually a rare plant. This, this is a lupin that lives in the San Gabriel Mountains and it's restricted to that location. But it has these really beautiful blooms. And here's a blue butterfly of some sort. I don't know what butterfly is. <laughs> but it's also appreciated in the lupin. Because the whole purpose of these magnificent displays is what? To attract pollination, uh, to attract those insects. And in fact, this just reminds me, I wanted to put a slide in. I, I, there's a plant, okay, I was in the Shoshone area, which had a nice bloom this year. And there are some plants in, in the phlox family, the genus Linanthus, that only bloom, they only open their flowers at night. This is the genus Linanthus, but this is a day blooming one. So there's some white flowered Linanthus species that only bloom at night, and they're wanting to attract pollinators in the evening. And one way they do that is not only by having the visual and being white in color so that it can be seen at night, but also by releasing scent. And so you could be amongst these, when you're in a super bloom, sometimes the smell is overwhelming and sometimes it smells interesting and good, but sometimes it can be sickeningly sweet, like almost nauseating, because it's like really intense. This particular Lyanthus that I smelled, you know, was, I had watched, to, to find a particular flower, and then I was leaving in the evening, and all of a sudden this smell happened, and it smelled like uh, like cup of noodle soup. Like it, had, it did, it, it had like kind of like a savory smell, um, not sweet at all, it was very strange. And then I knew until I was like with my uh, companion, I said, oh, it's this flower, and they're, because I know that they're, I think they're beetle pollinated, Beetles like kind of little spicy, savory smells. <laughs> uh, so we bent down and we smelt it, and then oh, we couldn't unsmell it. It was like, oh. <laughs> it was really cool though. Um, so um, so yeah, so tons of color, sense. It's just like all these different sort of sensory experiences when you're like in the super bloom, right? Uh, and so we have lots of yellow. Yellow is like a big color, big super bloom color. And a lot of early blooming plants tend to be yellow. Um, and so this is desert gold, which is the big yellow bloom that happens in Death Valley. Um, so desert gold usually makes a show on the Valley Floor. That didn't happen this year in Death Valley. The Valley Floor didn't have enough rain to, to stimulate the desert gold, but I'm sure we'll see it in future years. And then you'll know what it is. This year, the desert dandelion is really doing so. I took this picture this year. I took this picture at Red Rock Canyon State Park this year. This is still going in and around the Ridgecrest area. It's just going off. Um, so if you want to see desert dandelion, drive up Highway 395 or 14, and you can just see them on the side of the road. Um, orange, 
um, going yellow to orange, and we have Mariposa Lily that's orange. Uh, a lot of times people think it looks like, kind of like a poppy, but it's a whole different plant. Mariposa Lily, the desert Mariposa Lily. And of course we have the orange poppies. So this is a display from Riverside County. This was in 2019, we had a big poppy year. And there's actually two kinds of poppies in this photo. We have the California poppy, and then we have a, a different poppy called cream cups. And that's these right here. It's in the poppy family as well. And then um, of course we have red super blooms as well. And we have um, the Mojave King Cactus. So cactus are definitely uh, magnificent flowers that, that people like to see during the super bloom year. And they're usually kind of on the later end. You know, once you start seeing the cactus blooming, you know other herbaceous plants are going to see. So you tend to see them a little bit later in spring. And then of course we have the paintbrushes. And the paintbrushes are really interesting because it's not actually the flower that's showy, but it's um, some bracts that enclose the flower that are the red showy parts. And then the flowers sometimes are really small and green, um, but they're oftentimes hummingbird pollinated. And so red flowers usually attract hummingbirds. Um, they're very attracted to that. Then I have to put another monkey flower because I study monkey flowers. And I think this is kind of red. I don't know if it's red or purple or what. Um, but this is the Mojave monkey flower, uh, Diplicus mojavensis. I believe I took this photo in like 2016, maybe. I did not find it. It did come up this year in very small numbers, but I didn't try to find it. Um, we actually have this. We're doing uh, propagation trials on this species because it's rare, and we want to like help conserve it. And one of the ways we can work on plant conservation is by learning how to grow them uh, so that we can make more seed and store their seed. Um, and this particular species, I have um, speculations about what pollinates it, and I think flies might pollinate it, because if you look at the flower, and it has these like kind of maroon veins, and then it has this like black hole, who knows what's going on in there. But it kind of looks like maybe it might be mimicking meat, Mm -hmm. And when flowers mimic meat, usually they're pollinated by flies. Oftentimes, like, you know, there's a corpse flower that's really stinky, right, is mimicking meat. Uh, this I've not smelled anything, you know, putrid coming from the flower, but it doesn't mean that there's not some kind of scent. Maybe we just can't detect it. I don't know. But when you further study, you can actually grab floral scents by, like, putting a bag over it, and then there's, like, a machine that hooks up. I've never done this research. I've seen it done. And then they, like, they suck out the chemicals and then they can analyze it. They can actually capture the scent. Mm. So it's, it's really interesting research that happens on floral scent. And then we have purple mat. Um, a lot of super blooms, you know, are big and showy, but some of them, like I mentioned, are these belly flowers. So this is, you know, my key, uh, just it's like very low to the ground, um, but very common, uh, bright pink. Although it's called purple mat, I think it's pink. There's always debate among flower colors too. Some people say that's purple, and some people are like that's blue. Maybe we can get our uh, color charts <laughs> to like, better uh, determine. Uh, sand verbena. This is a plant that occurs in sand dunes. So this is one you would see out like in the Coachella Valley Preserve, which in good rain years, the Coachella Valley Preserve is a wonderful place to go to see wildflowers. Um, I don't. I didn't go there this year. Some areas are blooming nice around there, although I don't think it got a huge amount of precipitation this year. And it tends to bloom earlier. A lot of sand plants tend to bloom like in February, March. And then when we get into purples, we see a lot of the genus Facilia, which is um, in this family called the Hydrophilaceae. And that's its common name too, is Facilia. Um, and um, these are yellow throats, Facilia fremontii, so named because their throat right here is yellow. And um, I saw a magnificent bloom of these. This is a photo from this year. They are very abundant in certain locations. And then the lacy facilia is a very um, charismatic flower that is good for gardens, really good bee flower. 
Um, and so you can find these in seed mixes, I think Malpar seed mixes and things like this. And then of course the, the more lupins, the bush lupins are spectacular. And I think these are gonna have an extraordinary year this year. And you can find bush lupins in our local mountains. So you can see these blooming well into you know, the summer season. You just have to go up in elevation. But if you're driving along you know, the San Gabriel, like um, the uh, Glendora Mountain Road or Glendora Ridge Road, there's bush lupins there and you can see those there and you can see them up you know, on your drive up towards Big Bear and things like that. And then the desert bluebells, this is more, this is my blue flower, it's not a blue flower. <laughs> it's kind of purple blue. Um, but there are some flowers like larkspur and certain phacelias that have like a really striking blue color, um, which is more uncommon um, amongst wildflowers. And then just to complete the color wheel, I had to add green. <laughs> and this isn't a flower, this is a plant and fruit. Uh, this is the Desert Holly, Aquiplex Hymenolytra. Um, it's one of my favorite plants, and it's not considered a wildflower, technically, but it is a very showy, beautiful desert plant that is wind-pollinated, um, and a lot of times those plants don't get as much love, you know, as wildflowers, so I have to put one in as a wind pollen appreciation. Wait, wind pollination. Um, and so the, this, the thing that makes it, a wildflower season so special is that it, it, it lacks permanence, right? It's not like a tree that could be there for 500 years. It's, it's here today, gone tomorrow, and we don't know when we'll see the next one. So it may, you know, you kind of feel this sense of urgency to get out there and see it and kind of uh, see that beauty and, and soak it in and you don't know when it will happen again. So it's very fleeting. Um, and so right now we're in this season um, where the temperatures are turning, right? It's getting a little warmer. And you know, maybe it feels a little sad, like, oh, the flowers are gonna start to dry up soon. But you know, it, they're, they're going to seed. So that's like a really good thing. That means they have successfully reproduced and they're putting seed down in the soil seed bank um, for future super bloom years. So, so that's the, that's the end goal. The culmination of this event is seed. And so this is a plant, a monkey flower and fruit. Um, I went to see that Red Rock Canyon monkey flower this weekend. They almost lost all their flowers, but they're headed into fruit. So even though, you know, it's like, okay, you know, the bloom is over, I was so happy to see the emerging fruit. And so temperature plays this really important role. And so um, this is looking at long-term climate data, again, from that PRISM data set, looking at uh, maximum temperatures, the average maximum temperature for a 30-year time span. And you can see that it really, so the average maximum temperature in April is about 77 degrees Fahrenheit, but by the time we get to May, so it's gotta be May next week, we're getting to 86 degrees, and that's when it's we're getting pretty warm, pretty hot. And that's usually when the low elevation blooms really go to seed. Um, and then, you know, if you want to see flowers, you've got to start to move up in elevation, like above probably three, 4,000 feet um, to start to see flowers again. Probably get to 5,000 feet. Actually, 5,000 feet is a good zone in May. Um, and what's happening is, you know, like I mentioned, seed production. And so that's the other component of the super bloom. That's like, you know, I said, what's required for the super bloom? You need cool temperatures, you need um, above long-term average in precipitation. But what do you really need? You need a really large soil seed bank. So that's what's germinating, is there's billions and billions of seeds that are alive. These are living organisms. They're in their dormant phase and they're living in the soil. And so their seeds are spent a lot of time being asleep, right? And then they're very long lived, so they can live many, many decades being asleep in the soil until just the right conditions come, and then they're ready to do their thing and complete their life cycle. So one of the things that makes um, super 
blooms sort of sustain or the seed bank sustain is that even if you have the perfect set of conditions, like you've gotten tons of rain at all the right temperatures, you've you know, had sufficient rain to stimulate germination, um, there's some fraction of the soil seed bank that will not germinate. They'll stay dormant. And that's really important for maintaining seed in the soil seed bank and not have everything go at once because what if you had everything go at once and then all of a sudden they all dried up and they didn't complete their life cycle to set seed back down? Then you would kind of have catastrophic loss of seed bloom. Uh, so it, 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 it's kind of like a bet hedging strategy. It's like some of them are gonna go for it, but there's always a fraction who are like, nah, I'm gonna wait. And you know, not, not that I'm trying to like infer that they're consciously making this decision or not. <laughs> but it just evolutionary, you know, strategies like this is what occurs and, and some amount won't germinate. And so we've talked a lot about wildflowers, but I also I want to do a shout out to the shrubs because they're really important in super blooms as well. Um, so sometimes the shrubs act as nurse plants for certain wildflowers. So when you go into the desert and you see creosote bush, you see burrow bush, which is its companion shrub, they're always together. And you'll see flowers like growing out from the middle of them or from the base of them. And so we call that the nurse plant effect or phenomenon. A lot of times cactus get their start in, at the base of a nurse plant. And so what that is, is it's a area where these little seedlings that are getting started, they're protected from herbivory. It's a moist microsite. It's basically a nursery, right? It's a nursery for seedlings. And there are some um, plants that only live or primarily live in the nurse plants. So uh, there's a flower called desert chicory. You almost always see those growing out of nurse plants. They, they don't do as well kind of outside of the nurse plant. And so I'll show you an example <coughs> of a nurse plant. This is a rare plant, it's federally listed. It's federally listed as endangered. It's the Lane Mountain Milk Fetch. We have lots of milk fetches in California. Um, and it's kind of hard to see it because it's totally entangled in its nurse plant. <coughs> its nurse plant is a plant called turpentine bush, Damnosma montana. Um, but it's in there and I have a close up. So this is the, the actual plant and it's in fruit. And it's never found outside of a nurse plant. It always gets a start in a nurse plant. So it's really, really important um, to, that the shrubs are healthy because um, that really contributes to the overall, you know, uh, super bloom life cycle for certain species. And then of course, these blooms support pollinators. So like there's, it's not, it's, it's a wonderful thing, you know, brings a lot of joy to be able to experience these magnificent displays. Um, but it's also recognition that it's this burst of life that's happening and you have pollinators, you know, just buzzing about and they're able to, you know, really kind of ramp up their life cycle as well, you know, kind of paired up with flowers. So um, in 2019, I don't know how many of you remember, but we had an incredible painted lady migration that, that coincided with the Super Bowl. And it was such a wonderful event. Like they kind of came through our neighborhoods, they were going through wildlands, and it was just like being enveloped in butterflies. So, so we can have these, these great phenomena kind of happening in tandem and obviously they complement each other. And then these ecosystems, so these herbaceous ecosystems aren't, right? They're just, they're beautiful, but they also support lots of animals. So they're really important for granivores. There's lots of birds that rely on the seed that is produced in the super blooms. Like this is a lesser goldfinch, which loves um, seeds from plants from the sunflower family. And so, um, so it's an opportunity for them to, to feast and to, you know, be healthy. <laughs> Especially because, you know, this particular um, event that we had is, feels so um, sort of supportive and sustaining and, uh, you know, it's wonderful to kind of experience the joy of it because, right, we've had multiple years of not just drought, but like catastrophic drought. Like, very severe drought. And that's impact, had a very tremendous impact on wildlife. And so this is a time of renewal 
um, for wildlife to rebound. And so uh, there's just um, lots of food availability and that's a great thing. And so, right, wildflower displays aren't just for the beauty, they're like actually food. <laughs> Uh, and they're food for, for herbivores as well, like the desert tortoise is my favorite vegetarian um, that eats wildflowers, like the desert tortoise loves wildflowers, and that's what, what, how it sustains itself in its life. This is a baby desert tortoise I saw in Joshua Tree like in 2006, um, and this is a federally listed species. Um, the drought is certainly impacting it um, and its life. They're very long lived. Um, and so this is a time for them to really kind of regain health. And these are some wildflowers that the desert tortoise um, uh, enjoy, some of their favorite foods, I've heard. And in fact, so I know a little bit about this, I'm not a wildlife biologist, but we work with um, the Bureau of Land Management, which manages acres and acres, you know, of public land, especially in the desert, and they have a program called Seeds of Success, which is to collect seeds for restoration. And so we assist in that program. And a lot of the target species that we're collecting, the CETA, are um, species that are important for desert tortoise. And a lot of them are wildflowers. And so these are some of our target species that we've had teams out collecting these species this year um, to support restoration and to support the desert tortoise. And so these are really, the um, not only important food plants, but I hear in particular the desert tortoise really like the mallow. It's very tasty. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of like, you know, talked about these different sort of ecological aspects of super blooms, right? They support herbivores, they support granivores and pollinators. Um, but people, we're a part of the ecology as well. And super blooms have sustained people uh, for you know, tens of thousands of years. So we have the, the people who are indigenous to California, many, many tribes, many, many cultures who tended super blooms, who, um, you know, had, um, it was a primary food source, you know, like the, the chia, the sage, you know, you can buy uh, Salvia Hispanica, which is the commercially available chia, but our local species, uh, Salvia columbari, was um, used for food. And so we have some information or records of this. Uh, this is a quote from Father Juan Presti. He was a Franciscan missionary. I um, redacted some of his language because he uh, referred to indigenous people in a very derogatory way. So I'm going to use an uh, alternate word. But I'm just going to read from his quote where he says, um, he's describing a super bloom of Chia. And he says, the entire countryside all over this great plain is full of chia that is very good for refreshment. So much of it that I thought it impossible for the indigenous folk, a great many of them, though there are, to gather even half of it. It was in bloom at present, purple colored bloom. So he's saying there's so much of it, there was no way they could have gathered all, even half of it, because it was so much. And we know that the indigenous, the people indigenous to this land did gather the chia and they offered it to, you know, the people who then came and settled and colonized uh, here. And, and it was an important food source, a very, very important food source. And so there were other wildflowers as well that would have provided important seed sources. And I just think it's very important to recognize, you know, in our modern day society, we live in a very built environment. But people have always been a part of nature. And even in modern day society, we're still a part of nature. Um, even though we might have sort of more control or we might try to have more control over nature, we've heard about maybe Tulare Lake, maybe we don't have so much control over nature. Um, but um, we have influence, we interact with nature, and so we're very much a part of the ecology of super bloom. I think especially when we think about how we interact with wildflowers. We're gonna get into the more culture part later and think about um, sort of responsible wildflower viewing. Um, that's definitely like interactions with nature that shows that we're a part of it and that we can have an impact on it, whether it be positive or negative. Um, and so I think we can all find ways to have really positive interactions with nature um, and by recognizing how we're a part of it and we have influence on it. 
And so one of the early influences of the uh, Spanish colonizers was the introduction of invasive species. Um, so people from, you know, who came from Spain, they brought with them cattle and they brought with them invasive species. And they started to fundamentally change the landscape of California in a very significant way. And so that's one of the things that super blooms have to contend with is invasive species. And um, in fact, so there's this really great book called California's Fading Wildflowers that examines sort of the transformation of wildflower prairies to um, many areas now are dominated by these invasive um, grasses and or mustards and no longer support the wildflower fields that they had. Um, so he kind of examines the cause of that or different makes different interpretations of what it would have looked like prior to major development. Um, but some of these weeds are documented fairly early on um, in um, mission bricks. Um, they, you can find these invasive, the seeds of the invasive species in mission bricks, adobe bricks. Um, and so these are just, um, eroding cicatarium is the red stem fillery, uh, black mustard, um, cheese weed, um, poa annua is a common grass, invasive grass, Corium muriagin is barley, uh, medicago, hispida, and medicago indica are types of like clover, um, bird clover. And um, so in, in this picture, I have um, house clover, which is native, but then I have these, this is the red stem filament fruits. And so they're ubiquitous, they're everywhere, and they came fairly early on. And so, but we know we had super blooms still in the Los Angeles area in the 1800s. This is a point of, this is from 1847. This is Pasadena area, and it's just covered in wildflowers. Mm -hmm. And so th this quote um, says there was a sailor who um, was coming to Los Angeles in 1847, and he said that he saw all colors, all shades of colors, all hues, all tints, all combinations are there to be seen, and the endless variety bewilder the senses. Perennial incense, incense ascends to heaven from these fragrant plains. And so you can only imagine what that was like. It was, it must have been so magnificent. Nice. And so it turns out wildflower tourism became very popular in the Southern California around the turn of the century. Um, and so there were actually um, organizations and like boosters, people trying to promote tourism in Southern California. And one of the ways they did that was by showcasing the beauty and poppies and sort of like tourism and poppy fields. And so here we have people gathered and they picked all these poppies. And you can imagine the feeling perhaps then of abundance and permanence that this would always be here and this is, this is just how it is, you know? and that you could take and it wouldn't necessarily have that impact. But I think now today we know different because this wildflower field in fact now is urbanized. It doesn't exist anymore in this fashion. Um, and so I think it's really important to remember that we still do have these magnificent ecosystems, but they are a remnant of what they formerly were. They're, 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 they're highly reduced. Um, so it's very important that what remains, that we do our best to protect them and to preserve them for future generations and for the ecosystem, for not only for ourselves, but for the animals, for the tortoise, for the birds, you know, for everything that sustains off of them. And so we had a changing landscape. We had rapid development in uh, Southern California. So this is Los Angeles in 1929, and you can see it quickly changed from agriculture to an urban landscape. And this happens to be around the time that the California Botanic Garden was established. We were established in 1927. Our founder, Susanna Bixby Bryant, um, understood that there was a threat to California native plants and wanted to establish an institution to support them, to sustain them into the future. And so we're here today, and that's what we continue to do. And this is um, from the, the original papers, the purpose, why the garden was established. The purpose in part was to preserve the native California flora, to try to replenish the depleted supply of some of the rarest plants, which are rapidly being exterminated. 
So this is from 1927, that the, these ideas were already, you know, already, it was already understood that was what we could lose at that time. And so we have had large landscape level change. And this is just the fact of our society. We've had you know, expansive urbanization. The Central Valley is huge agricultural lands. Central Valley was a massive wetland that supported lakes and tons of birds and wildflower fields. The Carrizo Plain is a remnant of the massive ecosystem that was in the Central Valley. Um, and, and so, we now, we live in, La I was born in Los Angeles County, we live in Los Angeles County, uh, the most densely populated county in the country, over 10 million people in our county. And yet, I mean, so we, we have lost um, ecosystems, but yet we still live in California with over 6,500 kinds of native plants and over 2,400 rare species. We still have it. And so I think it's really important that we do our best you know, to care for what remains and, and that we can also make things better, I think. I think we can find ways to make, to bring nature into our urban landscapes. Like we were in a suburb here in Los Angeles. We have 86 acre garden here that supports bobcats and coyotes and gray squirrel and all this life. Um, and so it is possible to, to live with wildlife, you know, amongst people. And so I think that the garden is a showcase of here are super blooms from space. And you can see how complicated the landscape is. Um, you have magnificent wildflower fields, but it's intermixed amongst, we have a housing development over here. We have emerging new threats of solar development up here. And so it's a complex landscape. Um, and so in thinking about conservation and how we protect these, it's, it's not really cut and dry, um, but it's a lot to think about, like what we still stand to lose. You know, we've our, we have lost so much already, but we, we stand to lose more. Um, and so it's important as a, that we're sort of like collectively um, can support these conservation efforts that are wanting to, you know, conserve these lands for the future. And so, um, I, <laughs> you just, just take this in for a moment. Here's some solar rays, here's some poppies. But, um, I do want to think about this. This is a very, you know, climate change is an existential threat to all life on Earth. And so it's really important that we do address climate change, that we work to decarbonize, you know, our lives, right? Um, like, it, it, climate change, not good. Um, but we are addressing climate change in a way that's also causing harm to ecosystems, right? By, we're, we're doing large development in the desert. And so here's a super with a solar array in the middle. And it's very complicated, you know, renewable energy infrastructure is needed, but it's being done in such a way that's also um, further developing um, the environment. And so I like to think of how, like, nature's not in the way, nature is a solution. Um, we, Takes a lot of area um, and for which we drive our vehicles that produce carbon when nature is a carbon sink, right? Nature takes, the plants take carbon out of the atmosphere. So we need more plants, probably less cars. <laughs> I'm not advocating for like uh, deindustrializing or anything like that, but I'm just saying that there's definitely some trade offs, but I think we can be more creative and think about our future in a way that maybe we can decarbonize while not also causing more ecological harm. I guess that's, that's my general stance on that. But then, okay, we talked about tourism, wildflower tourism in the past. Now let's fast forward to think about wildflower tourism of today. So many of you may remember in 2019, we had the quote unquote poppy apocalypse where uh, in like Elsinore, um, it was kind of mayhem. I actually didn't go there to Walker Canyon, but I saw the photographs and people were trampling wildflowers. There were lots of social trails created. There were safety issues around traffic. <laughs> it was just like, it was a frenzy, right? Um, and I thought about this a lot as we had waves of atmospheric rivers coming in and I was 
excited. I was like, this is so wonderful. We need this rain. And then I kind of sat with it and I thought, oh, all the newspapers are going to call. They're going to ask if we're going to have a super bloom. And then everyone's going to go and trample the flowers. <laughs> um, and, and I wanted to, I want people to, to access, I want people to enjoy nature. I want people to get out there and I want people to appreciate it but it needs to be done in a way that doesn't cause harm. So I wanted to, to kind of start a conversation, you know, I kind of took to social media, try to start a conversation and think about how we can <coughs> increase awareness and education so people recognize that, um, you know, trampling the wildfire fields is not, is not the way to, to, you know, fully embrace and appreciate the super blue because it causes harm. And spread invasive species, you know, um, cause soil compaction, all sorts of impacts. Um, I think that you know individuals certainly play a role in that in terms of what you choose to do and how you kind of like interact with nature. But I also think that this so this is a, a photograph from this year that was published. I don't know how many newspapers picked it up, but a lot. And I think it is sensationalized by popular media and people see this and they think it's okay and then everyone else wants to take a photo like that. Mm -hmm. So I think that tends to kind of perpetuate this idea that this is socially acceptable. Not just socially acceptable, but that it's just an appropriate way to interact with nature. Um, here's another one that was a popular photo. And I, mean, I, I want these people to experience the joy of wildflowers, but I think it's important to recognize that we can't just all go tumbling in the poppies because they're, they're trying to reproduce <laughs> their, their, their life. And so it's not just, I think, innocent fun. This is a image from social media, this person that I follow, um, Brian to the Shrubland. Um, he took a drone over to Carrizo Plain and he captured this imagery that shows all the social trails and all the impact that they cause. So it's really not, you know, sort of just casual fun. Um, so I think if we can have maybe more imagery like this or points of education, um, perhaps that could um, sway public opinion. So in the end, really, I just think that like, we, it's, it's sort of a, I think it's a larger scale societal issue around stewardship and care and connection with nature. And we know that that there are studies that have shown that, you know, I'm a person at the urban environment. I just happen to become a professional botanist. So I'm like in the, I'm like studying flowers all the time. So I've just like have formed this very intimate connection with flowers and nature in a way that like, I kind of think about them all day. <laughs> They're like, you know, my buddies. <laughs> I get to see when it rains. Um, and but and so because we're not it's not our food source like we go to the grocery store to get our food and we're not interacting we don't understand necessarily how they sustain us even though they do even in our city they sustain us um we aren't finding ways necessarily to understand how we can give back or that our actions can cause harm and so this is the, the nature deficit or nature disconnect I believe that that is something to remedy that will help us to preserve these into the future. And so creating um, an ethic of care and having that, you know, you know, we here at the garden we have school tours, like all these things are important um, to um, fostering nature connectivity for the next generation. Um, so my this is my quote from a I got interviewed by the Guardian where I said, like, I don't think, like, the solution is not to cordon off nature from people. That's the opposite of what we need to do. We need people in nature. We don't need to close off access from nature. We need people engaging, interacting with nature, but beyond seeing plants as a beautiful backdrop and understanding the greater significance of what it represents um, and our role and how we interact with So, I mean, so just, this is, I love, this is a, on LA Times Plants, this artist, um, Larissa Selena, she, she's like, the quote was, it's like, shopping for my cute outfit, 
show me where the cute outfit you wear to respectfully visit a potty resort. Um, and you know, I just would love to have increased access to nature because we are nature, we are a part of nature, um, and it's for everybody. Um, I grew up in the urban environment. I never really interacted. I didn't even know it about native plants growing up, but now here I am a botanist. I know a lot about native plants, and I get to share that with people. Um, and I know that the more time you spend, the greater the connection, just from my own lived experience. So um, it's just a lot that I think that would be better um, for everyone if we all had better access. So I, I do think that a path forward um, in thinking about the persistence and um, the conservation of wildflowers is really to, to increase access and education. Um, and, and I think that's important, not in this time, like we, we're having this talk because we had a super bloom this year, but that education needs to continue in the non-super bloom years. And I think it's important for people to connect with nature even when it's not a bounty of amazing wildflowers. So that it's just like this continual relationship that we have. Um, and, and I think there's a lot we can do to make nature more permeable into the urban environment um, where we can have, you know, maybe they can last in wildflower fields or we can also build our own super blooms in our yard if we have that. Um, you know, people, if you have a balcony, you can grow native plants in containers. <coughs> I've heard people who do this and the pollinators still come. So it doesn't have to be, you know, container plants also add to nature in the urban environment. Um, this is my, the dog and my mom from sitting for Riley, and I wanted to have him take pictures of the room. This is in my yard. <coughs> this is my homegrown super bloom, and here we are. I made our own super bloom, and it was glorious. You know, it's like I go into the field and I see the flowers, but I also appreciate it and love having it in my home. Uh, so here at the California Botanic Garden, we're doing a lot of diverse work to address plant conservation. So that's my role here, is I direct the plant conservation program. And so I get to oversee a broad spectrum of work where we utilize our incredible resources to bring that to, to nature, to, to work to conserve native plants. So we're doing inventories. We still are describing new species, you know? There's new wildflowers that are part of the super bloom that need to be described. I mentioned the Erythrae Petra at the beginning. I described that in 2012. I have a, there's a relative of it and that lives in the Tehachapi. So I'm gonna go in the field and see it this year that I think is an undescribed species. Um, so we're doing inventories, we're describing species, we're monitoring rare plants, we're doing uh, genetic studies on rare plants. For seed banking, we have the California Seed Bank, which is a large seed bank dedicated to health native plants. We have the soil seed bank, but in order to conserve these plants, we also need like an offsite, you know, sort of Noah's Ark of seeds. <clears throat> We're doing restoration in areas that are now dominated by invasive plants and including invasive plant removal. <clears throat> and of course we do, we have a graduate program in botany where we train the next generation of scientists and we do all sorts of education. Um, so these are all things that I think are really important to advancing conservation of native plants. So, <clears throat> you know, I mentioned my, th you know, a lot has been lost, but there's so much that remains. And I think that the future of, <coughs> the future of nature, it always includes people. And so, <clears throat> I think we have to see ourselves as a part of it. <coughs> Sorry, I need to drink my water. Um, this is a monkey flower I study. <clears throat> and some of its habitat has been burned and is now being invaded by <coughs> grasses. And so this is an invasive grass, but we now have a lot of hope for this monkey flower. And it's through the work of people that it's got to ensure that these, these species can persist in the future. Oh, and so that's what I have. So the desert hand was a cool plant. It came up and broke this year. I think you can still find some around. Um, but that's how to call you to contact them if you have questions. And I'm happy to answer questions. <coughs>